Uh, thank you. I am uh, so glad and honored to have the opportunity to speak to you uh, today. Uh, my wife will interject that she uh, wishes I hadn't quite volunteered for this particular day. Uh, but uh, I'm uh, happy to float across the country to be here with you right now. And uh, I will be talking today about this, this talk. We'll have, we'll have a little bit more of an episodic structure uh, than uh, talks normally have in uh, some ways. Uh, and it will, I'm warning you, uh, in some ways be like a talk it's sort of like a talk about green, where I talk about some yellowish things, and I talk about some bluish things, and then I kind of, there's kind of like toward green uh, uh, as the larger theme, or maybe it would be like, like a bunch of stuff about like whalish things and harpoonish things, and then like, oh, like Moby Dick uh, happened uh, somewhere. So uh, don't be surprised uh, at that uh, as it comes about, but I'm trying to give you a larger overview of sort of what I think is the sort of the larger quarry uh, for uh, this topic uh, or for uh, uh, that social scientists should be doing who are interested in the, the uh, interplay of, of biological, psychological, and social domains of analysis, uh, and then the particular, uh, this particular tool that is the polygenic uh, score uh, and what it offers to sibling uh, data. I like this particular picture uh, up here uh, of the train because uh, if, you, if you look at the train, and you think to yourself, what direction is that train going? If you look, if you look, eventually you'll see it, right? Where the train, is the train going one direction? Is the train going the other direction? And you look as you think about it more that perhaps the directionality of the train isn't even what's ultimately uh, important for thinking about. Now, um, so we're going to talk about a few different things and then, uh, and then we're going to sort of think about how they sort of come together. Um, as an as a animated thing for the logic of how to think about uh, certain intersections, of social life. We can think about the example of depression. This uh, draws upon uh, some work of, of a group in, in Holland that I think has done some great sort of intersection of, of psychometric and other uh, levels of analysis. But depression is, uh, is diagnosed, if you look at, at uh, a DSM type criteria, they'll give you a number of different symptoms of depression. And you could, on a survey, you could ask people, a catchment survey would ask people about the presence of these different sorts of things. If you have so many, perhaps you get a diagnosis of depression, or you can construct uh, a score uh, out of, of these things. And when we think about that, it's easy then to think about this. We could, we could also, if we had that score, we could put it together in we could do a factor analysis, and we would pull out of that some kind of general factor. We could give it a letter, we could call it D, and we could imagine then that this is this underlying construct of depression, and that what we're really seeing is we're seeing this latent underlying thing that is a property uh, of the brain that is leaking out into all of these things. And maybe we have to talk about serotonin, maybe we talk about fMRI, whatever. Um, but we can think about things in that particular way. That's a classic sort of latent variable model. But then when you start to look at these symptoms, you notice really that that, uh, that misses something that's sort of obviously going on, right? Because we recognize that these symptoms actually we see as existing in causal relationships with one another. Right, we see the idea that, that, that sleep problems, we recognize, have an effect on appetite, they have an effect on, on mood, they have an effect on, on uh, ability to do things. Right? And we, obviously something like appetite has a relationship with weight change. Right? So, so when we think about this, instead of imagining this latent underlying construct that bleeds out and shows itself into all of these other traits, looking and then looking for where that is instantiated uh, in the mind, we can also imagine Right, the, the part of what would be going on is if you have a sort of a dense network of different constructs that have that have a causal relationship with one another, that would induce a correlation among all of those things in and of itself. Right? You wouldn't necessarily need this latent underlying thing. That latent underlying thing might not be playing uh, quite the role that we would imagine, especially in terms of being a unitary latent underlying sort of thing. Right? And that leads to the idea of what could be called, it could be called a few different things, but one of the ideas uh, would be called a causal mutualism. Right? Mutualism is a biological term sometimes used for sort of systems. Right? But then we can have things that are sets of variables in the world that have this direct, mutually reinforcing relationship with one another. Right? And those mutually reinforcing relationships can by themselves give rise to what we would see as being some kind of superordinate property, something like depression. And that can even, in circumstances, be something where that superordinate property or has a causal property, cause 
causes of its own, right? In the way that someone then being diagnosed as depression could be a different tracks of treatment, right? Things of that nature. So, so uh, uh, regardless of how it arises, once it arises, it can have a certain uh, causal power in its own right, right? But it can also be the case then when we think about what it is that ultimately underlies this, right? And and the history of depression uh, genetics is is a story where people thought. Uh, like so many things uh, with genomics, it was going to end up being simpler uh, than it was. And for a long time, it was one of the great uh, elusive things in, in uh, genetic structure. And still, uh, to whatever, so there's a lot of sort of failed efforts. Now there's some reason to think that there might be uh, the ability to construct a polygenic store. We're going to talk about those more later. Although even that's the source to date uh, don't necessarily work that well. In other words, there was this idea that, okay, well, these different symptoms, once we get down into the biological stuff, it's going to be this more simpler sort of entity, but in fact, it turns out that the influences are very diffuse at that level, which doesn't mean that diffuseness might not be useful, but it's not the case that by going to some lower level of analysis, now we find the real thing, right? right. So with that, we can think about uh, health despair, right? Um, this is our second episode, right? A long time ago, uh, I did some work related to diabetes. Now, diabetes has is an interesting story from the perspective of health disparity. The lines here is from, from a great uh, history of diabetes called Bittersweet. Uh, the gray line there is before 1922, um, and the black line there is mortality uh, after 1939. Right? Well, you see, diabetes went from a type 1 diabetes, went from something from which there was no inequality in outcomes of diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes, because everybody died. Uh, in about uh, 10 years. They wasted away, and then they died as a result of diabetes. Right? But in 1922, we have uh, the advent, the first advent of, of insulin, uh, which has developed since then, right? It has a dramatic impact on mortality, right? Now, uh, it is a great public health story. It's a great public health, or a great triumph of health research. But at the same time, right, in that creation, and you can even see it in, in the historical data here, although it hasn't been, uh, quite pointed out from that, right? In that creation of this advent of, of progress with diabetes, we create the potential for disparity. So now, with type 1 uh, diabetes, there exist disparities in terms of people from lower socioeconomic status having uh, worse consequences uh, from diabetes, right? The consequences we think of having uh, amputated feet, having blindness, uh, dying earlier, um, than uh, wealthier people, right? And so a long time ago, with this ethnographic work I did with collaborator Karen Lusty, uh, she was an ethnographer. We had this, this uh, ethnographic uh, data based on two hospitals that were across the street from one another, uh, one of which was a county hospital and one of which was a uh, hospital that had a higher uh, SES uh, clientele. And I was sort of asking, okay, well, what does it look like if you just look at clinic visits uh, from these diabetes clinics? What would one think about the relationship between socioeconomic status and diabetes? Right? And the point of that, of that paper, and the point of the ethnographic research that was so striking, was that when you look at a diabetes, it, in some ways for thinking about health disparities, it has a nice property where the negative consequences of diabetes are closely connected to your, your long run, the amount of glucose in your blood over the long term. Right? You have high glucose levels, and this is what causes the vascular complications, it causes the problems with the teeth, it causes the problems with the eyes, it causes all the vascular problems. So if you see things that lead people to have poorly managed glucose, you see things that even if you don't see it in that person, right? You, you have all kinds of hypotheses generating of, 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 okay, well maybe it never matters for that person, but in the aggregate, if it's something that contributes to higher glucose, you can imagine that it's gonna be something that contributes to consequences. And when you look at the clinic in detail, what you see, right, is you see all, all kinds of ways, right? All kinds of ways that intersecting with their lives from, from, from the failures to see uh, the same doctor twice in a row to having to deal with residents who, who uh, on average had not seen diabetes uh, patients for more than two days from all of the, the compromises and exercises and diet and all the ways that they have swing shifts at work and things. You saw all kinds of different ways. Ways that in a way made silly the idea that uh, which exists in, in some ways that, you know, that there would be one sort of unitary and simple thing uh, that one could think of as being an explanation for health disparities. Instead, you can, or, or for diabetes disparities. Instead, you can see where, and, it's, and one can imagine it being a prototype for a lot of chronic disease outcomes, where it's a death of a thousand things. It might be or a 10,000 things, 
right? Even if it's something that manages to be collected in some big idea of care, that really it's a lot uh, of different things. And the other thing that one could see in that data was the difficulty of taking something like socio. So people talk about socioeconomic status and health, and it's it's, it's there's a lot of, of, of literature that talks about socioeconomic status and health, where it derives the concept of socioeconomic status because it says, well, that's just a placeholder concept. And what we really need to see is we need to see education and we need to see, see, see income. But what one can see right, is, is, is the way in which these different aspects of socioeconomic status, in a, in a sense, comprise a system. One can see one aspect compensating for another aspect. We can see ways that, that these things are, in a sense, fungible for what ends up being socioeconomic status. Right? And how to think about that then, right? if we put the pieces together here, Right? We can imagine thinking about socioeconomic status and health as itself being an intersection of different systems. It's interesting to think about because when we talk about socioeconomic status, those of us from sociology, we, we automatically and obviously think about something where we recognize the different aspects of socioeconomic status cause one another. That people go and have returns to school and that lead to higher income, that educations are intimately tied to this. In other words, we see a system in which we have different aspects that one can measure that cause one another. One could do a factor analysis. This was, in fact, a big deal in the status attainment literature. One could give this a letter. One could call this SES. Right? Um, and we have that. And on the health side, there's been increasing interest in doing versions of this as well, right? where one looks at different aspects of health. I talked about specifically with the president looking at general markers of health. One could give that a letter, one could call that H, maybe, or one could just change the phoneme slightly, maybe, and call that H, right? There's interest in looking at biological age as opposed to chronological age, is something that one can get at with biomarkers as a byproduct of, of a system. And so in terms of the big picture, in terms of what we think is really going on, those of us who go into social scientists, our lot in life is that we've chosen, we've chosen this world uh, of very complex things where we see different systems and we see them over time coming into alignment where social advantages and disadvantages of the body, like uh, different aspects of health, come to be in alignment over time. Individuals over the life course will often have different parts of their lives that come together and in that process they become different from other people over the life course. Right? And we see older people and, and as a result of that being a lot of ways much more heterogeneous than younger people, right? So, we can think of that, we're just moving, we're just building, building to something, right? Where we think of cognitive test scores, right? Because cognitive test scores, again, we could put up something here where we have different types of <laughs> cognitive tests, right? The single most important finding in the cognitive test literature is what's called the, the positive manifold. It's the idea that Cognitive test scores, you can't come up with two different recognizably cognitive cognitive test scores that are not correlated with one another, right? Um, which means that you can pull out of a set of cognitive tasks, but you can, you can pull out some ultimate general factor of those cognitive test scores. You could give that a letter. We could call that G, maybe. And in fact, that is what the general cognitive ability we can call that. And in fact, that's what's been done in this literature. This idea of G uh, is exactly that. Um, uh, is this idea of pulling out some general thing. But again, when we think about it, right, we can see from different kinds of cognitive tests, we can see again this idea that cognitive skills actually, we would imagine, uh, building off one another. Certainly, certainly when we think of general knowledge skills, we can imagine how reading skills lead uh, to building of other kinds of knowledge skills. In other words, skills like other things. And one of the things that, that pervades the cognition uh, literature is, is this sort of implicit dualism where people don't see uh, cognition as an aspect of the body. They don't see cognition as being uh, an embodied trait, even though, of course, that's, that's what our, our brains and minds are, is, is part of the body. We, when we give, give cognitive tests, we intentionally isolate people from being able to use anything else in their environment to do the test, right? It's not the case that you can use Google while taking, right? You have to use, right? So we, we make it something that relies on uh, on our, our, our body in doing the test. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip this on heritability uh, because I just want to get at this, this angle where uh, heritability is a, is a technical concept in, uh, in behavioral genetics. It's used 
uh, in, uh, in, and then it, that creates all kinds of problems. Uh, technically speaking, uh, the heritability of a, tra of a trait in a population is, is the extent to which uh, genetic differences uh, resolve the differences in the phenotype in question. One of the ways that that gets off into a wrong foot with, with uh, sociologists is that, is that uh, all of the indirect effects of, of a trait through the environment count as part of the heritability. It almost feels unfair to people. An example would be to imagine something where you have uh, differences in, in uh, reading ability that manifests itself very early. This is a favorite, uh, famous example from Sandy Jenks. Right? But you have a difference in reading ability that manifests itself uh, uh, very early. Uh, as a result of that, a child reads more, a child gains an identity as a reader. Uh, as a result, the child practices reading more in the same way that uh, a tall child, you can see practicing basketball a lot more, and as a result, being a better basketball player, possibly being a better free throw shooter, and other things that they would be otherwise, other things that would be unrelated uh, to height. In the same way, you can imagine that kind of gap in reading emerging. All of that, right, all of that uh, difference that ultimately emerges, even though sociologists would recognize that as an environmental difference, would get counted in behavioral genetics as part of the Harold Bill. And in a counterfactual sense, that's correct um, uh, to count it that way, but that's because ultimately causes don't add up to 100%. Uh, they add up to something much larger than 100%. But, but, uh, but this is the way that the things work, right? Uh, or the, the estimate of heritability works. Now, why is that relevant? It's relevant because there's some different puzzles that emerge. We're getting the polygenic stuff not too far, but just to see. There's some different puzzles that emerge. Things that, things that are odd about, about uh, heritability of, of cognitive ability. They've been taken on their own as being uh, puzzles. Um, all these are supposed to come up one by one. Um, but um, one is that up there, estimates of the genetic influence on cognitive test scores, they increase with age, right? So it's, it's, it's uh, the heritability is low, lower uh, among kids who are six or eight uh, than it is by age uh, 18 uh, or so. Um, another thing is that there's been a steady population increase. This is called the Flynn effect in cognitive test scores uh, to, some, to such an extent that that uh, for an average person uh, projecting back to their grandparents, it's like, it would be almost, not, not yet, but not far from the cusp of where, where a child would be recognized as having a developmental problem if they, if they presented with those scores uh, today. It's been a steady increase. There's also this curious finding where uh, more culturally specific tests tend to be more heritable. And that's, that's something that is not quite the way that the standard intuition about this would work. And it helps them to think that, that we need a different intuition. That is to say, uh, take, for example, a vocabulary. Right, which you recognize as being enormously culturally specific. Translating a vocabulary test into another language is very difficult. You can't just like look up the same word if it's, you, you know, that's a different difficulty and all of that uh, sort of thing. Um, uh, whereas things like putting blocks together or whatever is much easier uh, to translate into another language. Right? The more culturally specific test, we might imagine that that cultural specificity would be something that would work against the heritability of a trait. But that would suggest, if you think that way, that would suggest that the way you're thinking about it is in fact wrong. But instead, right, the more culturally specific test, something like vocabulary, is in fact highly heritable relative to other sorts of tests, suggesting right, that this is a difference that emerges over, over, over time and, and is integral to how we think of learning is happening. And then also that there's, there's uh, evidence, of a somewhat mixed evidence, that you have this heritability of cognitive test scores that increases as SES increases. This is most closely associated with uh, uh, Eric Turkheimer, but in other words, right, uh, there's the idea uh, that possibly higher SES environments draw out these differences more. We might think of it, that would be the idea. All of these together, when you add them up, lead to an idea that gets close to what we were talking about when we were thinking about social and embodied characteristics coming into alignment over time. Would be this idea that we have pervasive alignment, right? And that is to say that, that we think of embodied characteristics in social environments, pervasively uh, reinforcing uh, one another. So, so something that people will do, you see this uh, uh, ubiquitously uh, in some literature, is someone will see a trait that doesn't vary very much uh, over the life course, or especially over uh, adulthood in terms of its rank or its stability, and they'll say, well, that's evidence that that's just some biological thing showing through that, that, is, that is impervious uh, to the environment. Um, but when you look and you think about how worlds 
social worlds uh, actually work, either with respect to something like cognition or something with respect to health. We might think of embodied instead, the way the world probably really works, right, if we, if we think of the world around us, is these embodied characteristics and social characteristics pervasively reinforce one another. Right? Even if somebody intervenes on one little aspect, they're really only intervening on one little aspect within a whole welter of things going in direction. So in other words, environments and bodies come in a way over the life course to be more aligned with one another in a way that would preserve their rank order stability. Right? So in other words, why would you expect massive rank order disruption, disruption in, uh, in midlife uh, because people have already uh, selected into that environment? And we could even imagine that that would be something where that alignment become something we could itself imagine. Instead of, instead of this world in which we're, we're trying to do models of, of socioeconomic status causing health versus health causing socioeconomic status or something of that nature, where it really varies over time or it really varies over place in an interesting way, it might be the extent of this uh, alignment or, or these processes by which the body uh, and environments come to match one another over time. Right? Incidentally, uh, we have done some work on this with Florida, um, with some economists. Uh, we have, uh, so this is uh, economist David Figlio and group. They have uh, data where they've matched uh, birth records and education records for everyone in the state of Florida. And then we're able to take the twins uh, from that data, uh, same sex and opposite sex twins, and sort of look at this idea. We've actually found pretty uh, mixed evidence. We have not found uh, the obvious versions of this hypothesis to be true. Although it also turns out that the obvious versions of this hypothesis are not that well behaviorally specified, so we're not quite sure what to think of it. But it's not a great triumphant story for this view as of yet. Okay, now we're going to talk about educational attainment. Uh, this is the story, and this is the last of the major parts. So don't worry, there's not 20 more of these coming up. Right? We're kind of sort of bringing it uh, together and bringing in polygenic scores. Right? So with educational attainment, right? That is something that shows. Evidence of heritability. Um, so Amelia Brannigan, who's a student of mine, uh, uh, and she, she basically went out and collected uh, twin correlations from everywhere that we could find them uh, to look at. So you can, from a, a monozygotic and dizygotic twins, you can construct an estimate of the heritability uh, of educational attainment. Uh, and over, uh, over the world, uh, one sees an estimate of the heritability at about 0.4 for uh, educational attainment. Educational attainment, uh, as an aside that I can't get into here, but, but we've shown educational attainment is actually uh, very unusual in a different aspect of its heritability from anything else that behavioral geneticists have systematically uh, studied. Uh, I can't get into that uh, here, but it, it, it is interesting uh, in that um, Basically, so educational attainment is the single most, if you look at AJS and ASR for sociologists, the single most studied variable in sociology. That's not a straight up uh, uh, demographic uh, variable. And that uh, educational attainment exists as this great exception for how this pattern of behavioral genetics that was so robust it's even been referred to as a law. Um, but I can't get into that here because I need to talk about the molecular uh, genetic components. But one looks at the heritability of educational attainment and the question, well, is that something that with the arrival of molecular genetic data, we're going to be able to interrogate further? And uh, it, uh, educational attainment for a while was emblematic of this. Yeah, yeah. Broader narrow, in this review, broader narrow sense heritability. Big age, little age? Well, so that is, you know, that is actually a great and deep question. Um, it, is, it is a bigger question than you, than you might think. Um, so it's heritability in the sense it's heritability in the sense of the classic Doppler formula, right, of taking two times the, the mz by dz to indifferent. The reason that that becomes an interesting question is whether that is broad or narrow sense heritability. And you would be surprised at, uh, at the different answers that one would get to that very question. In other, words, in other words, I wasn't sure, and I went, then it was like, well, I'll ask an expert. And I've actually had that reason uh, both ways. One would assume that it's a broad sense heritability, and the heritability in the broadest sense. Um, but there's other reasons on that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so the early idea of candidate genes was that was that um, one could take a genetic variant 
one could look at the variation in that in the same way that one could look at another kind of variable in a regression model, right? Plug that in uh, and use that uh, in analysis. This particular example uh, called TAC1A, um, it is near uh, a dopamine receptor gene, DRD2. Uh, everyone, uh, more or less, uh, is either homozygously, homo, uh, has, anyway, they either have two C's, uh, a T to C, or uh, two T's, right? Heterozygous, that's it. Um, right, they either have two C's, two T's, or a TC, right? So this is what they found in Ad Health. You notice it's nice Carolina blue here for Carolina for Ad Health, right? Uh, and finding this finding in the sample of 800, you know, you can, you can put three stars by it uh, or whatever. Um, but, you know, then you look at it in different samples. Uh, we looked at it, for example, in the Wisconsin data I'll be talking about in a minute. And one finds that it doesn't replicate, right? And this, this was the signature feature of the Canada gene era, is that you had a lot of findings that failed to replicate. Some of the stuff that did replicate, one worries, was due to actually different kinds of confounding, like... Uh, different kinds of ancestral confounding. confounding. Uh, in other words, the Canada gene era, you'll have people say things like, oh, that was back in the days when now we think that 99.7% of that stuff were all false positives. This wild west of things that were statistically significant that people don't necessarily believe uh, anymore. Uh, and diffuse enough that it's not something worth about any one investigator or anything like that. It just really didn't work out. I mean, in retrospect, one can look and one could think, this, this possible gap here, this is like a 25 percentage point gap between this and this. You know, how credible would it really be that you have one genetic variant that would have that kind of massive influence on, on uh, educational attainment? But it's an idea that, uh, in other words, that difference is as large in the ad health data set as the entire black-white gap in the, in the data set. Is it really possible that one genetic variant would have that large of an effect as all of it? Uh, the entire edifice of, of racial stratification in the United States. Um, in retrospect, probably not. Um, so then, what after that becomes the, the issue? And uh, what comes after that and has been promising uh, is this idea that well, maybe if we put together very large uh, groups, a consortia of different data sets, we can arrive at something uh, that we can use uh, uh, as we can first, we can sort of nail down things that look like they are actually causally real. We can use discovery samples and things like that. Uh, this group uh, from Publication in Nature, uh, this I think mobilizes about 300,000 people. They're excited because they're putting together other things. Their next thing is going to be a million people uh, to put together for this. But uh, as the sample size gets large, the number of these genome-wide significant hits uh, has gone up. Right, from a methodology that looked like it was not really going to work to a methodology that now uh, people uh, are finding much more uh, challenging. Right? And it's something where one sees different hits uh, across the genome. So this is what's called the Manhattan <coughs> plot. Right? Uh, so this is, these, are, these are variants across the, the 23 uh, chromosomes. The things that are above this line, because polygenic scores involve a very large number uh, of, of uh, different SNPs, something on the order of about a million. You need to correct the p-values, so this is a p to the negative eight, right? So it's a stringent threshold. In that regard, but one can see all this evidence of significant hits across the genome. In other words, um, uh, there was a period where there were only three of these. There was a period where there weren't any of these. This is looking more and more like something that is uh, emerging, right? And this is a story for a lot of different complex trade outcomes where you have this emergence now with these genome-wide uh, assets, right? Uh, and so from this, one can construct a polygenic score, right? As I'm going to use it here, right, a polygenic score is going to be something that's going to be based on the genome-wide associations that are observed in a consortium of other samples. In other words, I'm going to be applying it to a data set that has nothing to do with the arrival of those GWAS scores. I'm going to be taking the weights from that, but again, it's entirely out of sample. Right? So there's not any kind of these, none of the people in this data were in this data, right? Um, we're also using, uh, or it also uses a principal components uh, method to address for confounding by uh, ancestry, uh, particularly the, in, in the uh, analysis, basically the, one should think about the GWAS analysis itself as, uh, as uh, certainly intending to be uh, arrived at more or less with, with only European ancestry. Uh, respondents, and then the data we use 
will also have only European ancestry respondents. Uh, but also even within that one, the principal proponents uh, spin out ancestry uh, further than that. Uh, and then also it's something where there's different ways of doing this. One could use only those 74 variants that were above the line. Um, the method that we're using here is going to construct them from all of the variants, not just the ones that happen to be beyond a significant threshold. Right? But obviously the ones that have larger effects are going to be uh, above the threshold. They're going to be more likely to be, um, have a bigger weight. Right? So the data that I'm going to be using are data from Wisconsin, uh, the state of Wisconsin. Um, a pop culture reference that is getting less recognized with each and every year is the TV show Happy Days. But Happy Days <laughs> was once upon a time was a very big deal. Happy Days was the number one TV show for three years in the 1970s. Um, Happy Days, if you're not familiar with Happy Days, Happy Days involved the adventures of uh, there was Patsy Weber, there was Ralph Mouth, there was the main protagonist, Richie Cunningham, and then there was the breakout star, uh, the Fonz. But, but an interesting fact about Happy Days is Happy Days took place fiction, at fictional Jefferson High in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, at, from uh, uh, Richie, Patsy, and Ralph were graduates in 1957. Right? The Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, uh, which I'll be using uh, uh, for the analysis that follows, is based on a one-third sample of 1957 Wisconsin high school graduates. In other words, was if Happy Days was inspired by real events instead of utterly fiction, right? We would have uh, Richie, Patsy, and Ralph would all have a one-third chance of being in the WLS. That's how it works. So, so in expectation, one out of the three of them, Richie, Patsy, or Ralph, would be in our sample. Now, not the Fonz, because the Fonz was actually two years older and did not graduate from high school, although he did get his GED in season three. Um, <laughs> Now we can look if so. We so so these people have been in paneled and have been uh, interviewed at different intervals since 1957. Uh, in in 2006, 2007, and then again for people we didn't get in 2012, um, we collected using a couple different protocols uh, saliva samples that have been assayed then for uh, for uh, that we have GWAS assaying on. We've only got the GWAS data. It's a tremendously long process it took uh, to get it all funded and complete. But we've just in the last couple of months have gotten it and have been hunkered down uh, working on it. Um, but one can see with the GWAS data, so this is just, these are the principal components that I was talking about, uh, just for uh, respondents who, who uh, don't report any non, uh, for respondents who report exclusively European uh, ancestry, they're asked about their mother and father. And particularly we can see from even this, if we just look at the first two of those principal components, if we look at respondents who when asked about, about the uh, ethnic background of their mom and dad, uh, either report German for both parents or British for both parents or Scandinavian for both parents. Right? One can see even in those principal components, one can see the clustering of different groups. In other words, one can, one can pull out, one can see obviously this, this passes the ocular test of a difference in the GWAS principal components between British and Scandinavian respondents in this larger category of German respondents uh, over that. Um, uh, so there's real stuff here uh, in that sense. Right? And if we look at the graduate sample, uh, for that matter, so I can just break, so we can make this uh, educational attainment polygenic score. We can look in that in deciles from lowest to highest, so we break it up into 10 deciles from lowest to highest. We can look at their probability of reporting either some post-secondary education in red or a bachelor's degree in higher in blue. Right? If we look at that in the WLS data, we'll see uh, a clear uh, relationship. Right. We can see where it goes from the lowest decile to the highest decile in terms of, of continuing past high school from something like 30% uh, to upwards of 60% in a sample. So not something we would associate as a small effect in that sort of way in terms of, of, of uh, the relationship of that score. Right. Now, an interesting thing about, uh, about the WLS right, is, uh, is, well, if we continue the happy days uh, example, uh, Richie Cunningham, imagine he's been selected into the sample. Uh, Richie uh, had a, his family there. Also has his sister Joni. Uh, Joni uh, eventually married Scott Baio, who became uh, a cameo figure in the recent presidential election. But for our purposes here, uh, WLS also impaneled siblings, right? So in other words, we would have uh, Richie and Joni uh, in uh, our sample, a randomly selected uh, sibling uh, from each family, right? And so we have we have full siblings. 
right? We can get the educational attainment for each of those pairs. We have about 2,100 uh, pairs uh, in our uh, sample. And we, so these are actual known full siblings. We know, we, there are people who reported to us that they are full siblings that are not uh, in our data, full siblings are, are excluded. Right? We, whether, they, whether they know that they're not actually full siblings, we don't know, and obviously uh, that will never be uh, broached with them. But, <laughs> but um, so these are all full siblings, and one can see the scores uh, for full siblings correlate at about uh, 0.53 with one another. Right? But, what yeah. Are the axes? Mm. This is the score. So the score is normal. So it's standard deviations. Standard deviations among this. So I, I normalized it on this particular, on the subsample. Right? So it's normalized on the, on the or something you can think about it, it's normalized on the sample. Right? So now a simple way of thinking about, about uh, this is a way of displaying kind of the fixed effects idea. Because now we have a within family thing. So now what I showed before was just a graduate. So it was all between families. And but since we have a sibling, we can, we can kind of break this out and think about, okay, well, well, we have the pair average, right, in terms of their average score, and then we have the individual difference from that pair, right? So it could be the case that everything that was really going on with that score was really something that was a between family thing, but not really about the differences within family. That would be kind of, in one way or another, something we would recognize as being, as being spurious, right? Um, in that case, we would see a between pair effect, right? But we wouldn't see a within pair effect. Right? It would all be between pairs. Right? Right? A different scenario, if we might think of it as if it was uh, causal in the sense we would recognize it, we would think that the, the sort of the same effect should exist between pairs as exists within pairs. Right? Does that make sense? This is a way of breaking down the fixed effects logic. Uh, thought it might be good for presentation uh, purposes, right? And so, and this is something where, right? So we observe the between pair effect, and then it's like tension as we were, you know. Cause like, saw this work in other data sets, but it's different when it's the data set that, that I, who knows what this guy, but what we observe uh, is uh, more or less uh, the same size effect uh, between or within, right? Um, uh, which would be straightforward with uh, the causal uh, story. Uh, and another thing that this allows you then to do when you have this score, uh, that the people, one of the reasons that the people who did this, educational attainment is something that you can possibly get measures on a million people about because it's asked in so many, it's an easy question to ask and, and for being such an easy thing, uh, the measurement on it is pretty good as opposed to cognitive function, which is much harder to measure. But once you have this, you can start to, so this provided some of the early sort of reliable stuff uh, helping uh, break through on um, or move forward uh, uh, genetics on cognition. Right? And we could ask for ourselves in the Wisconsin data, we have their test scores in adolescence from uh, Wisconsin State uh, testing records uh, that were obtained. So we can look at its relationship uh, with the adolescent test score uh, in the data. Um, we have, uh, that's, uh, the metric of that is in, uh, in standard uh, deviations. So we have the between pair average there. We can run it there and we see, again, uh, there's an effect. This, this is the educational attainment score. Uh, also shows uh, an effect on cognition, right? Uh, something I don't have a, a plot for but should um, a question then is, well, is the effect on educational attainment all through this cognitive test score? Is all the information in cognition? Uh, that would be a plausible hypothesis, perhaps. It is certainly not uh, the case. Um, in, in, instead, less than, just uh, somewhat under less than half of the effect in our data of the test score to educational attainment is mediated by a uh, test score, to or the effect of the, e the polygenic score on educational attainment is mediated by the adolescent test score, even taking into account uh, measurement error. Um, so it's not just something that's getting at whatever it is test scores are getting at. Right? We can also look at this, and some people have done this looking at all kinds of different uh, outcomes, um, but one can look at this with respect to things like uh, different kinds of socioeconomic outcomes. Uh, occupational prestige was also on the slide, uh, but then I'm making it a little bit more of a, uh, thing, but, um, it, it, it has the same kind of pattern, but I wasn't sure about something with the coefficients, so I pulled it the last second. Um, but if we look at home value, if we look actually at the people who have left the state of Wisconsin, uh, if they were interviewed in their 50s outside the state of Wisconsin, um, uh, we see these different patterns where uh, we see a relationship in the bivariate 
um, but we know uh, it's attenuation once, in this case, taking education into account. Right? Uh, the larger pattern, actually, with occupational prestige, it's, it's uh, more dramatically uh, the case that uh, most of the information is carried. In other words, if you know the educational attainment, you know uh, the relationship between the score and that outcome. There's not some independent uh, relationship, for the most part, in other words. Possibly vague signals of it. Right? There is some indication that there might be information to this is instead, this is again the bivariate relationship and this is net of education. This, these are questions where the respondent was asked to compare themselves to their sibling. In other words, compared to your sibling, have you done much better in education and work and finances or much worse? It's five point scale from much better uh, to much worse. And you can see here, this is statistically significant but not at, at the point uh, 05 level. One could see this possibility, this is net of education, um, and even actually it's still statistically significant net of test scores. This possibility that when the sibling says, uh, my sibling did better in schooling, that there's information there that's in addition to whatever information there is in the actual education attainment itself or even the test scores. In other words, siblings may know something, um, and one would think that they would, uh, than what we know, or what we can see in our data. Right. Um, and one can, one can look at this to look at different kinds of questions of that one would imagine uh, to be of uh, significance from a straightforward social stratification perspective, right? So a lurking thing that, that exists in, uh, in social stratification literature would be this question of, okay, well, we could show a relationship between family background and educational attainment, right? Um, but there's always that lurking idea, well, is that something where the family background and it, it's, it's all, really there's genes, is what it is, uh, and we're just observing various uh, relationships as a result of that. One can actually look at the percent of attenuation that one would uh, get from an SES um, a family background measure uh, as a result of including the genetic information. Now, if I just show that attenuation, that attenuation is quite small, right? but the score is only a small part of what we, the score is not the genomic influence. The score only predicts some portion in our data, about 4 or 5% of the variance. It's believed that there's 3 to 5% of the variance. Um, uh, it's believed that uh, the actual true score variance is higher than that. This is just using an error in variables uh, technique. Um, we might have to think about exactly the assumptions of that more frankly. Um, but we can look at different assumptions about about the error variance and what we would expect. Uh, the scenario you get, this is the amount of attenuation. This would be if, if taking the genomic score into account doesn't attenuate the relationship at all. Uh, that up there would be if it attenuated it completely. That would be the all genes type scenario. Um, it does depend on the assumption about the error, the amount of error uh, that one makes. It's also kind of a ultimately, I would probably think the real values. But, uh, it's kind of a half full, half empty type graph, depending on uh, your view. But it's certainly the case that any scenario where it's entirely attenuated to something like that is not, is not consistent with these data, but also a scenario where it's not attenuated at all is also not uh, consistent uh, with these uh, data. Okay. It's also the case, incidentally, that we can show that... Um, and the score is also related within families, within siblings. So if you take two siblings, we asked about the siblings' uh, educational, uh, or the siblings' children's educational attainment. Right? So we asked about each of their children. Uh, the score is also related within families to uh, the probability of those children uh, completing college. It's about uh, three to four, well, it depends on how you do it. But there's, it's not a big effect. Um, but there is an effect there. Right? So we can even show intergenerationally, intergenerationally uh, that that score uh, is related to the scores or to the educational attainment of children, net of the parents' own education, net of the parents' test scores. Okay, so conclusion. Right. So I think that the integration, if, if one is, is serious about the world of integrating different levels of analysis, it's going to involve a lot of constructs that have a systemic aspect and the question of how those come into alignment uh, over time. Uh, with one another, um, and that is a lot of what uh, life course uh, inequality, I think, is, is this process of, of, of divergences. So in other words, individuals diverge, um, but the individual themselves become more coherent uh, in a lot of ways uh, over time. 
I think that's going to be a slog that involves a lot of different approaches. But I do think that the genetic data, because of the combination of its, its uh, exogeneity, uh, that is to say the extent to which that's one of the few things that we have uh, that is not uh, changed by life events, at least in fact in the case of the, the DNA as, as uh, this straight up DNA, um, is also the extensiveness of that. And then the fact that within siblings, you have this sort of natural lottery uh, in terms of their effect. But that's one tool, and I think possibly a penetrating tool by which we can understand uh, the relationships that exist between constructs at different levels. Great, that's it. That's my